Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of uh, One Plus One, your place for inconvenient shoot sign and myth busting. <clears throat> and on the program, we welcome back our returning champion, Professor Anton Troyer, who is professor of Ojibwe at, uh, at uh, Bemidji State University, Minnesota. He is the author and contributor of several books, which include Everything You Want to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask, The Cultural uh, Toolbox, tra uh, Traditional Ojibwe Living in, the Modern, Living in the Modern World. He's now dipping his hand into the uh, world of fiction, or a fi yeah, yeah, he's he's now dipping his hand into the world of fiction or a fictional world, but with a realistic setting with the werewolves don't die. And he's our guest for the very strict hour we have. So firstly, Professor Troyer, welcome back to uh, One Plus One. It is such an honor to have you back. Thanks so much for having me. A real honor to have you. And let's, yes, so let, let's talk about your uh, your new novel, Werewolves Don't Die. And very simple, the first question, which is, what is your novel about? <laughs> yes. So uh, this is a novel. The pr main protagonist is a 15-year-old Ojibwe boy named Ezra Cloud. It begins in an urban setting in northeast Minneapolis. And it is both a uh, thriller, uh, you know, murder mystery, and also kind of a tender coming of age story about a boy looking for clues to a murder, but kind of finding himself in the process. And, uh, you know, finding himself embroiled in the conflict, uh, Ezra immediately gets picked up by his family and sent to run a trap lab. Uh oh, one second, one second. Sorry about go. that, folks. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Uh, there seems to be problems with my internet. Anyways, Professor, uh, so can you repeat what you were saying? You you were saying that uh, that the uh, that the character Ezra gets involved in the conflict, which uh, results in his parents punishing him. So yes, uh, so uh, please repeat that. And sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. I'll take it over again. So you know the story is about Ezra Cloud. He's a fifteen-year-old native kid who finds himself embroiled in a murder investigation. The family, believing his innocence, trying to protect him both from the city and himself end up sending him to run a trap line with his grandfather in the Canadian wilderness. And he embarks on this journey of self-discovery. I, You know, for myself, um, we have a very large family. I have nine children. I've got, you know, six children. Door, three to go. I do, yes. Wow. <laughs> <Yep. Okay. laughs> All right. Yeah, and so I, I, have, I have found myself thinking a lot about this age of transition into adulthood. Um, I've also led a life surrounded by elders uh, in my professional and personal life uh, with our ceremonies and also recording, transcribing, translating a lot of our elders, especially in the early phases of my career. And uh, so the book is full of those. I, you know, I, I have often been frustrated about most of the literature about Native people. And reason being until just a a couple decades ago, most of it was authored by non-Native people who hadn't even talked to one of us or spent much time in one of our places. It wow. was always like the white man. Yeah, it was always the white man's Indian rather than Native people, you know, giving the rest of the world a window in to Native experiences and culture. Um, so I wanted to turn that around. But honestly, even some of the Native authored Native lit over more recent years, which I've been so thrilled with to finally have native people producing and creating in this space. Um, still a lot of it are stories of tragedy, trauma, um, characters who lament the culture they never had because of residential boarding schools and other oppressive policies, all of which are points well taken. But I speak Ojibwe, I'm hunting and you know fishing and gathering with my children all the time 
I, I'm not lamenting the culture I never had. I'm celebrating the living, beautiful culture that we do still have. And I wanted to give people a window into that. And that is something that I think is quite different. Um, you know, one of the other things that, you know, I think readers will find quite different um, in addition to it not being an imagining of the Native experience, but a window into it is simply that, you know, I think we've been doing a little better in recent years of starting to hold up more female authored works, starting to have more works from, you know, authored by people of different gender identities. And all of that is so long overdue. You know, it's about dang time. Uh, you know, we've also started to do a little better at unpacking what's wrong in our messaging to boys about what it means to be a man, kind of toxic masculinity yeah, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, but something we have not done very well and certainly not enough of is just show, well, what would healthy masculinity look like? What would it look like for a boy dealing with the things you know, in a story that's crackling with tension and engaging and so forth, but coming to healing and reconciliation and self-awareness. Um, and so I do think it says some things in that arena, which um, which will also hopefully make a good contribution there. Well, I, I, well, I actually have to ask you this question then about the novel because you say it's it's part uh you know it's part coming of age and also parts uh thriller murder uh, mystery and so forth and i find that's actually quite interesting that, that you've chosen to do that because i think a lot of us even even people like myself who are very interested in uh in in indigenous uh, stories want to highlight what's going on in indigenous communities and show the best and the most outspoken and so forth. But I think we all sort of fall into the trap of, of only talking about how tragic it is to be an indigenous person because of the extreme institutional racism, because of all of the, uh, uh, all of the uh, injustices, in, uh, you know, you know, intergenerational uh, trauma. So I find that's quite interesting that, uh, I mean, of course. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the you know the main character is somebody uh, who who is indigenous, who is indigenous, but it's not just yeah another story of oh, isn't it so sad? Uh, you, you know that Native Americans are in this chronic um, vicious cycle of poverty, institutional racism, and so forth. So right. I was you could if, if if you could respond more to that because I find that quite interesting. Yeah, I think most of the messaging, whether it's in the news, um, you know, in our education systems around the world, you know, in the literature, the representations of Native people are extreme debilitating poverty. They are trauma and tragedy, wars for the Wild West, reservations, drugs, alcohol, despair, suicide, you know, and, you know, these, there are real problems there and I'm not looking past real problems, but it's a very one-sided and one-dimensional narrative. Um, you could look at these facts about white people. Most of the school shooters in the world are white. Yeah. Most of the serial killers are white. Um, you know, a large percentage of people using meth are white. Those poor people. What happened to the white family? You know, they're so disposed towards violence. Someone should get them some help. And if you only messaged about pity and paternalism and othering, it would not, not only be not accurate, it just would be very unfair and dehumanizing. So in a way, even the progressive voices dehumanize Native people by the pity party mm. instead of a deep understanding of all the nuances to Native life. You know, I live here on the Leech Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. It's Very peaceful. <laughs> it is beautiful. Yeah. There aren't drug addicts running around in my yard, you know, like, you know, it's, it's such a mythology. Um, 
and it causes harm in a lot of different ways. It, it harms, you know, the perception other people have of natives, but it harms native people. Who wants to be the one that the world thinks lost all the wars and is, you know, living in squalor? And, you know, the reality is really quite complex. Tribes alone employ 1.1 million people in the United States. You know, the national budget for Cherokee Nation alone is three, a little over three billion with a B dollars this year. And as you've once told me uh, before, that, uh, not all reservations are these places of extreme poverty plus, you know, tragedy as well. It's complex. I mean, I've been to New York City. There's wealth in New York City. There are skyscrapers. There is Wall Street. You could focus on that, or you could focus on the people who are bathing their bodies in the runoff from the gutters, you know, of the United Nations building because it's the only place they can get a shower. Which story is accurate? Oh, of course, they are oh, both yeah. accurate. They're both accurate because New York is not one dimensional. It's not just you know, the unhoused population, and it's not just Wall Street. It's all of it wrapped together in the paradox and irony of an American city, you know, and reservations are like that too. Yes, we have problems. And we also have great beauty and great potential. You know, we, if you look at 1969, you know, 55 years ago, we had 57% of the native population was below the poverty line. Today, 23% of the native population is below the poverty line. And it does tell you two things. So one is 23% of a population below the poverty line is gross. That's an indictment on America and its oppressions, not native people and their lack of a work ethic. It also means that we just shaved 34 entire percentage points off of native poverty. And that was not because of some US government intervention, that's something native people did for themselves. So if anyone's curious about how do you disrupt intergenerational systemic poverty, ask native people, they have the best track record in the country, maybe the world for doing exactly that. And when we understand that, it can move us out of paternalism and pity, all those poor people to how do they do that? How, how can I contribute to scaling that up and amplifying that? How can we, what can we learn from that to apply for other groups and populations and it moves you into partnership instead of pity. And I think that's where we need to be. So I do hope that where wolves don't die will give people some, you know, some tools to understand and see the beauty of native culture, um, of native lives, but also wrapped up in a story that, you know, delivers the things a good story should deliver. Right. Like if it's just a story about a good guy who like fights the bad guys and the good guy wins, that is boring. Yeah. Right. If it's, uh, you know, if it's just look at the beautiful folklore, you know, boring. But if it's a story that, you know, has humans dealing with all of the kinds of tensions that humans deal with, you know, struggling through those things internally and externally, you know, and striving for resolution, then I think you get something different. So I did something, you know, with this book, I um, I knew that the toughest judges in the world would be my own children. So the youngest are uh, were ages 12, 14, and 16 at the time. And I, I uh, read it out loud to them in, in sections. And I knew that if they started going for their smartphones or rummaging around for a snack, that it was over and I failed. But they were in and they were, you know, who do you think did it? Could it be this? Could it be that? What's going to happen here? And, you know, so it was kind of a page turner for them, which I was really thrilled about because I, you know, I knew what it was like when I was uh, in school, assigned some text where I was like, dear God, please get me out of this room as fast as possible. And yeah, yeah. I knew it was like when I had a winner and it was like stuck in my chemistry book and I was secretly reading when I was supposed to be doing something else. And uh, so I wanted that. And, um, you know, doing fiction is different than doing nonfiction. I think, you know, if you take anyone's life, it doesn't go in a nice, neat arc, you know, yeah. you get a little more creative power in fiction, but there are different expectations for how a book will deliver. And so 
Um, so I, I spend a lot of time, you know, thinking and working on the story craft and character development and things like that. And uh, so far, you know, the reviews have been amazing and sales have been great. So I'm couldn't be more thrilled. Fantastic. Uh, you've actually already answered <laughs> a lot of number two, but let's dig a little bit deeper into number uh, in, 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 into my second question, which is uh, so what else? also inspired you to write this novel and how was it writing a a fictional novel compared to years of writing nonfiction for both a general uh, audience you know history buffs and folks mm -hmm. who read nonfiction, like myself and an academic uh, audience uh, i'm yeah curious yourself. oh yeah i you know i think the world wants everybody to fit into a nice neat little category like that person is a historian that's all they do that per person does language work. That's all they do. You know, that person does fiction. That's all they do. And I don't feel limited where like, I got to do any one thing. For starters, I've been telling stories my whole life, growing up in a big family, raising a big family, um, Ojibwe legends and stories that are ceremonies. Um, when you're doing nonfiction, you are also engaged in story craft. And, but certainly fiction was different. I found it fun, liberating. Um, you know, there's a lot more artistry that goes into, you know, a good fiction book. So I, uh, you know, I, it was fun for me to explore that, that genre. And I guess the readers will be the judge about how well it delivers, but so far so great. And actually that's a perfect segue to this question, because you're already talking about the uh, reception of the book. And are you hoping that if this novel becomes popular enough would you love to see it adapted into a film or a mini series and if the answer is no or if the answer is yes but on conditions such as i professor troyer want to be the I, you know want to be the only screenwriter <laughs> your response oh first of all yes of course i would love to see it developed into film um i understand that there is a business to filmmaking uh, and, you know, I would not have complete control over how it is developed. I think, um, you know, a rights deal is one thing, you know, negotiating for engagement in the creative process around a screenplay is another, you know, I would advocate for myself at all levels, but I wouldn't be so restrictive that it would, you know, kill a deal or something like that. Um, and, you know, it's very different, and you know, doing a screenplay as opposed to, you know, a novel. And I think there have been great adaptations and there have been some that have fallen flat. Um, so, you know, you advocate. Which, which, for your... which is why if it was adapted into a miniseries, I think sometimes I think sometimes that's a, a much better adaptation than a film in which it has to be like an hour maximum or it can be two hours. But then you have to cut out certain things, whereas, you know, a miniseries uh you know, I often say uh, I, I I shouldn't be bringing up J.K. Rowling, but <laughs> but uh, okay, her her transphobia aside, the Harry Potter books, which were immensely uh, uh, popular, I remember my uh, I remember my third grade teacher and fourth grade teacher reading aloud those uh, you, you know those books to me and feeling quite disappointed when watching the movies because so much stuff was left out so much good stuff was left out so if so yeah. so so i i still need to read your book but i would imagine you know that probably it would be more better if it was adapted into you know a mini series especially since uh there, since there's you know murder mystery thriller in this one yeah i mean every project is its own Animal, I think there there are advantages and disadvantages to every genre. You know, it used to be that human beings got most of their entertainment from books. You know, that's long over. You know, then they were getting entertainment from movies. And even that is really shifted and changed. And people want to sit at home and stream and yeah. like the deep character development from that you can do in a longer series as opposed to a quick, you know, movie. Um, and I think there are some trade-offs with all of those different things, both in the business sense and in the in the creative sense. So, you know, at this point, I think I'd be thrilled to get a, a rights deal and then see what we could do with it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, 
do you want actually uh be, you know before we get to all of uh, before we get to all my boring politics stuff related to uh, Native Americans, is there any is there any parts? Uh, would you like to read something from the book to uh, plug it and to give people like you, you know an idea? Oh sure, sure. I'm happy to give you a section. Uh, you know the book does do a couple of different things, so there are some sections that are kind of tender hearted and some are a little more action oriented. Maybe I'll give you a quick action sequence. Go right um, ahead. Yeah, and this is from like deeper into the book when um, Ezra is already out on the tramp line with his grandfather, um, you know, but it, I th don't think it'll give you too many spoilers for okay, major plot lines, but give you a little taste. So uh, there are 13 lunar cycles each year, and the Ojibwe calendar marks all 13 cycles rather than the 12 months of the Gregorian calendar much of the world uses today. March holds the intersection of two cycles that start the transition to spring, our season of new life and renewal. The Ojibwe lunar cycles that intersect in March are Bebuk Wagame Gizis and Onabani Gizis. These are the moons when the snow starts to melt and then freeze. It's also one of the snowiest times of the year. Some people call the last one on Dago Gizis because the crows mark the beginning of the great bird migrations back to the Northland. When those lunar cycles, Grandpa Liam always pulled traps. With the winter, with the weather starting to warm up a little, the animals moved around more. That made it prime time for trapping. By the end of the season, some of the creeks and rivers had more open spots, and the muskrats had predictable places and paths. Grandpa Liam was thrilled with our success this year. Grandpa Liam and I were in sync with every aspect of our trapping routine. Every other weekend, Grandma Emma or my dad would come to the would drive to the logging skid zone and we'd haul our hides to the truck with the Scandic. That's a kind of snow machine. And this is a winter landscape set in, in Canada. Um, so they could be piled up in grandpa's porch on the res. When we'd started the trapping season, I wanted nothing more than to be out in the woods as much as possible. But now I like the weekend trips back to the res. I had service for my smartphone and Nora really liked to text. So this is kind of a love interest that's been emerging in the book. Uh, Ruth and Nora even came back to Red Gut one weekend. Ruth was trying to get Nora breaks from Northeast when she could. Nora came to Grandpa Liam and Grandma Emma's for movies one night. We watched more Reservation Dogs and she giggled nonstop at Buster and Grandpa Liam's television antics. <laughs> so there's this kind of thread where Grandpa Liam loves native movies, like the old ones, Billy Jack, which is the first one where a native kicked the butt of a white guy in the movies and you know, so he's always laughing and the dogs in a frenzy barking around them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at this point, Ezra's convincing him to watch some more recent native stuff, which grandpa's <laughs> enjoying. They're, they're both kind of transforming each other in different ways. For our last trip to Chief's Ridge, grandpa Liam and I got to the cabin right at sunset. We planned a couple more weeks trapping before we pulled our sets and closed up for the season. In the fading golden light, we could see footprints all over the yard in front of the cabin and up to the shed. They were smaller than a wolf, fox, or coyote, but I couldn't be sure what they were. Grandpa Liam gestured with his mitten. Ezra, they're fisher tracks all over. They must be scavenging. I bet there's enough residual scent from our previous kills in the shed to keep them poking around. We'll have to be extra careful with our food and hide caching, and we should set a couple sets right on the wall of the shed itself. If they get brave enough to come raiding, we'll be ready. You make the sets. So a fisher is an animal. Um, and, the, you know, they weigh like 15 pounds. But they're very long. They look a little bit more like an otter. They're kind of long and skinny. They're the largest animal in the uh, weasel family. And they are predators. Pretty ferocious ones. Oh, wow. All right. I nodded and brought our supplies into the cabin. Then I spent 30 minutes tacking up fisher sets. I had to finish up with a flashlight in the fading light. I noticed a strong odor coming from the shed, acrid and penetrating. It smelled kind of like skunk, but distinct and oddly stronger. When I came in, Grandpa Liam was working on supper over the drawlet in his suspenders and dickies. A drawlet's a kind of stove that's wood-fired, but it's used for both cooking and heating. Um, What's that weird smell in the shed? Did you notice it? He laughed. That's those fishers. They have one of the strongest scent glands in the entire forest. They must have been spraying around in the shed. 
Once they spray something down, no other predator will touch it. That's how they protect their kills from wolves and bears. Since we were just back from the res, Grandpa Liam had fresh pork chops and potatoes for supper. It was a quick pleasure to finish that off. I read tracks by Louise Erdrich for a while. The tales of Eli and Nectar somehow reminded me of Grandpa Liam. In the morning, I woke first for a change, eager to check my fisher sets. I stoked the coals in the drawlet, added a couple logs, and then slipped on my muck boots and a jacket and went outside. The first hints of dawn were in the sky, but it was still pretty dark, and the overcast sky blunted the first light. But I could see a dark shape where I made the first fisher set on the side of the shed. I strode up quickly, excited at the prospect of a successful kill. Then came a blood-curling scream from the shed. There is no way to properly describe that sound. It was supernatural, like the worst witch sound in The Conjuring or The Blair Witch Project, only louder. I whipped around faster than a lynx on a snowshoe hare and bolted for the cabin, casting one terrified glance over my shoulder just in time to see a large fisher charging straight at me. An adult fisher can easily weigh 15 pounds, but they grow to three feet in length and look much larger in their winter fur, especially when they charge you before you even had a chance to pee first thing in the morning. His first bite caught my jacket from the back before I could get to the cabin door. I could feel him pulling and shaking his head, hissing through clenched teeth. The animal was utterly fearless. The cabin door sprang open and Grandpa Liam whirled around me in long johns and bare feet with the push broom, Buster close behind, yipping and growling. Drop the coat, boy! I unzipped and dropped my coat, turning to face the snarling furry menace attacking it. Grandpa Liam shouted again, Grab the axe! Hit him with the blunt end! Shouldn't I get the twenty-two? No! He'll be more likely to shoot one of us or Buster. He's too fast to get a decent shot anyways. The fisher lunged at Grandpa Liam now, snapping the broom handle in his teeth. I had no idea something that size could be so powerful. The axe was next to the cabin door, so I seized it and clenched it in both hands, looking for an opportunity. The fisher seemed focused on Grandpa Liam now and Buster by his side. I swung once, furtively, out of fear that I might hit Buster. Then I slowed down and watched the pattern of his attack. Faint, hiss, lunge, retreat, repeat. I hoisted the axe above my head and swung hard on his retreat, catching him right on the back of the head. The fisher dropped in the snow. Stand on his chest, Ez! Grandpa Liam was breathing hard now, but smiling wide. Make sure he's not just stunned. Stand on his chest for three whole minutes. I did what I was told. When it was over, Grandpa Liam walked up and gave me a hard clap on the shoulder. There are easier ways to catch a fisher, but I'm glad you're on my side. I smiled and breathed a sigh of relief. Why did you tell me to hit him with the blunt end? Well, an adult fisher is worth $120. There was no need to ruin the hide. I'm sure the look on my face was completely incredulous. What? I knew you'd get him. We stood there looking at each other for a moment, Grandpa Liam amused and me still in shock. Look, Grandpa Liam said, motioning back to the shed. There was another fisher already dead in my trap. He turned and strode through the snow back to the cabin, still in long johns and bare feet, but hollering over his shoulder. We're off to a great start today. <laughs> and of course, that is an extract from the uh, that. Yes, that is an extract from the novel where wolves don't die, and we are and we are still here with the with the author, Professor Anton uh, Troyer. And changing subjects uh, a bit, uh, so I wanted. Uh, I so we. I asked you this question a long time ago on Twitter, but you said that Twitter is way too is not the right place to have such a big topic of discussion when it comes to this. <laughs> uh, when it comes to this topic, which is how do indigenous people of the United States, that part of Turtle Island, vote? Now, the late Glenn Ford of a uh, Black Agenda Report, he would often brag and boast that it was the black community that was the most left-wing constituency in the u.s especially on issues like peace and war so i so i'm i'm basically asking you do you want to give uh my people a run for their money and explain how indigenous people in the u.s <laughs> tend to actually be the most economically left 
socially liberal as well as anti-war and anti-imperialist. Uh, so I'm curious your response to that. <laughs> yeah, you know, first of all, every cross-section of the population is complex. There are Black Republicans, there are Black Democrats, you know, there are some people who find both to be too conservative. You know, <clears throat> you'll find a variety of views within the Black community. I think as a general rule of thumb, you know, the Black community is more likely to vote Democrat than Republican. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, and, you know, those things you can say with certainty. Um, there's some regional... And if you, you know, if you do uh, disaggregate by both race and economics, you know, it gives you more information about what's happening in the black community. Um, if you disaggregate by race, economics and geography, it tells you more. And I, I think it's the same with the native population. So, you know, the native population does, like the black community, tend to vote Democrat more than Republican, but you will find a cross section of views um, it's impacted by geography. It's impacted by socioeconomic status too. Um, but you know, you have some. In other states words, uh, in other words, so so in other words, I assume those indigenous people who didn't grow up in extreme uh, poverty and who might uh, run a very success a very successful casino and so forth. Uh, I would imagine if they're doing very well for themselves, they probably they probably would vote for, you know, Republican because of, you know, tax cuts and stuff like that or business friendly incentives. Yeah, I don't think that the economic concerns like, you know, rich people all vote Republican because it's going to save them money on their taxes. There are some people who think like that, but you know, or all poor people vote Democrat because better social safety net. And people yeah. aren't that simple. There are lots of poor whites who vote Republican. Yeah. Right. So if you just, you know, it's it's tempting to simplify things into an economic pattern or a racial pattern, but humans are complex and there are a lot of things that motivate them and motivate their, you know, voting behavior. So um, it is true that uh, the native vote is significant and growing um, and perhaps has been underestimated in American politics. You know, the 2010 census showed um, that there were 5 million Native Americans and the 2020 showed 10 million. We didn't have that many babies that fast, but they let you click more than one box. And the Native population is especially multiracial. And so the degrees to which certain issues really motivate Native voters, I think, is getting a little bit more traction. Um, you know, if you look at a swing state like Arizona, if you look just at like the Navajo reservation and the other like Tohono O'odham and some of the other big reservation areas, they voted overwhelmingly Democrat. And yeah. in a state, very fine margins that flipped and voted for Joe Biden, you know, the John McCain state that voted for Joe Biden. There were a lot of things that that impacted that. And, you know, I think Trump's stance, for example, in opposition to tribal sovereignty um, had a big impact on some native voters. You know, I think Arizona was a unique circumstance too because Trump was awful to John McCain, who was a local hero to many people of many different persuasions. Like even a lot of native people found cause to find affinity in John McCain because he served on the Senate Select Committee in Indian Affairs and he advocated for tribal sovereignty even though he was a Republican. So I think you know, he may have split the native vote, but there's no way, you know, like those who love John McCain are gonna have a really hard time voting for Trump. You know, um, there's some, of course, like the state was very narrowly decided, but I think Trump hurt himself in Arizona um, both with regard to tribal sovereignty and as John McCain issues. And that had a big impact on how that state voted in the last election. I think it will be again. Um, it's, you know, it's complex, right? Like if you look at Oklahoma. Oh, John, John McCain's legacy, I, I mean, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's even complex. I, I would say that that, that, that that it was largely very negative. But, but, but given this counter- narrative you've just given me i find that quite yeah fascinating 
Yeah, I mean, that's a separate issue to unpack all of John McCain's career and policy statements and impacts positive and negative. Um, you know, I, I do think that among Republican candidates, there are just a few left, like old school Republicans who kind of at least believe they were putting country before party. Um, the Mitt Romney or the John McCain, you know, John McCain's dead now. But uh, who would at least say, I'm not going to do everything the Republican Party says, I'm opposed to torture or things like that. There would be some stands that were somewhat principled on some of the issues. Um, and and much of the Republican establishment is just caved whatever Trump says, you know, and so that's really bizarre, um, yeah. you know, but it, it, those are side issues. If your real question is what's going on with the native vote, I think something else that's probably worthy of mention is that if you look at a state like Oklahoma, which has lots of native people, um, you know, the native people there, I think as a general rule, want native nations to thrive, support tribal sovereignty, are concerned about racism, things like that. But that particular state has a lot of native constituents who are also either Baptist or Methodist. And so there is some degree to which, um, you, you know, they're more moderate Democrats that, you know, who have a kind of a family values platform, not just a progressive ideals platform. And so within the native population, I think you will find some regional variations in, um, you know, voting behaviors and things like that. Oklahoma is a state where it's really, really difficult to get a Democrat elected broadly. Um, you know, it's a very conservative state. And I do think that you know, you'll find the same thing with the Latinx population, where yeah. in general, they're pretty concerned about racism, are really tired of the xenophobia, of the inability of DC to, you know, pass DACA and things like that. And at the same time, have a little bit more conservative family values approach on some of the social issues. So, you know, within the Latinx population, it's not like everyone's Democrat, everyone's Republican, the population there are some folks in the middle who can kind of go either way. And it's ironic that it is the Democrats that have struggled to really get their ground game going with the Latinx population. Um, you know, they, they need to have good talking points on these issues in order to make traction there. And I think if they do, you know, that makes a huge difference for them there. And I think the same can be said with the, you know, with native issues. So, you know, we look for strong stands on, sovereignty and things like that. I mean, Kamala Harris did make some statements about that recently that were really well received. Um, you know, so it's complex how that that will play out. But at, at the same time, it is really, really unwise for any politician to ignore the native vote or assume that it will go one way or the other. There is opportunity for any politician of any political persuasion who actively courts the native vote and has talking points that are relevant on the issues, um, it will hurt them or help them depending on how they land. And would you say that the indigenous community, that being said, I, I thank you, by the way, for that answer. It's quite fascinating. And then I think there should definitely be much more sociological work done on, you know, the voting, be, uh, you know, the voting behaviors and, and, you know, what, uh, and, and what the indigenous community is, you know, most concerned about. But I have to ask this question about uh, the indigenous communities when we talk about social liberalism. Would you say that in general, indigenous communities tend to be quite feminist, quite queer liberationist, and, and very much uh, eco-socialist? I'm curious your response. Um, I mean, yes. I do think, um, you know, the native populations tend to be ecologically aware, educated, and um, concerned about those issues um, in terms of, you know, those kind of like social issues, uh, gender, sexual orientation, things like that. I think, you know, the native population tends to be much more progressive and receptive to that. 
Um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, sometimes there's regional variation with regard to some of those things. So it's not all people in all places in equal measure. Um, but I do just, think yeah, so. Just, just like the Latinx and the Black community. Yeah, or an urban population, you know, like it's different in different places. And Dallas is different than Minneapolis with regard to the white urban population, you know. Sure. Interesting. And, uh, and, and, and talk a bit more about, you know, the whole concept of like the matriarchy and two spirits, because I think, you know, when we look at, you know, the, uh, when we look at the queer community now, with some people just identifying as queer, some people who talk about gender fluency and trying to sort of, you know, find their own gender identity before they say, you know, I'm, I'm this or that, or even non-binary is, uh, uh, which, uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that a lot of the queer community was actually very much influenced by indigenous people when it comes to the idea of two spirits. And I'm curious your response on that. Yeah, it's, um, so you're asking about the label or about uh -huh. lifestyle, um, choices and things like that. Uh, both, both. Yeah. So First of all, um, you know, I've done quite a bit of research on just gender identity in historic indigenous communities. And, um, you know, this also is probably a whole hour's worth of conversation, but uh, I have found throughout the historical record a really respected place for people who are trans and of really there isn't one or two or four gender categories there are really quite a few some studies have suggested as many as 26 different gender categories um i'm not sure how useful categories become when you have so many sometimes like um you know what you're talking about with regard to gender fluidity humans are complex um and you know trying to put everybody in a pigeonhole, you know, doesn't necessarily serve. But I have found like lots of evidence of historic, you know, in historical indigenous communities of very respected positions where um, it's people are considered not just acting on their freedoms, which is how we usually think of it today. People are free to identify how they want, um, but also like inspired spiritually um, when you know they're trans or something like that um and that they're very respected positions and councils and diplomacy and you know all the different things um george catlin who was doing all these paintings in the 1830s and so forth and he's on a big exploratory tour in the great lakes and plains you know had a famous painting you know which he called like dance in honor of the burdash of course burdash is like a derogatory term now it's out of out of use, but um, there's a trans, you know, woman in the center of this group of men who are dancing around and celebrating her. Uh, and so, you know, all of that, I, I think, shows just a different way to organize and structure a society or have social rules um, that were much freer and less judgmental and less limiting. Uh, now, since then, you also have like all the colonization, you know, and depending on where you look like I, in my area here, there are some communities where nobody has ever been baptized and 100% traditional religious belief in funeral practice and things like that. But there are other places that, like I mentioned in Oklahoma, where uh, pretty much most of the population is Christian one way or another. Um, and so then you've got the colonial, you know, etiquette and expectations which start to override some of the older indigenous value systems and in much more recent years over the past you know 50 years a lot of native people have been trying to unpack decolonize relearn revitalize native ways and so you know i think you will find people across a spectrum of belief from genuinely supportive to you know you know horribly judgmental and exclusive but as a general rule, the native population tends to be pretty accepting um, and supportive of people of different gender identities. And, um, you know, some tribes have even, you know, were early adopters of, you know, 
gay marriage ordinances and things like that long before the states around them had done so. Um, it's not everyone everywhere, you know, all at once, but I, I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that that's generally where more native people are at. Um, but with regard to the label two spirit, yeah. um, so that word is still widely used, including in indigenous spaces. It actually, it actually has its origin to an academic publication, you know, in the 1960s. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it, but it, it, yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't mean it's not useful, um, you know, but that's, that's its origin. And then I think it found resonance with some native people. Oh yeah. Two spirit, you know, um, although, you know, from my understanding of looking at these historic documents, it, it really depends on how you understand and interpret that. Like two spirit can intonate, you know, two identities in the same person as opposed to just one whole complete identity. Um, and so it requires a little unpacking explanation, context establishment. But, you know, the the label is still, you know, adopted and widely used um, in the Native communities and has been picked up by other spaces too. You know, so the acronym is really keeps growing, you know. Yeah, in so, Canada, uh, it, yeah, LGBTQ, yeah, 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 exactly. Plus, you know, <laughs> in yeah, in Canada, it's uh, you refer to the entire queer community as two S LGBTQIA plus. Right. I'm very proud of me for uh, I'm very proud of myself for actually memorizing that. So. <laughs> yeah. But then. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, I you know, I I just think um whatever people want and need. Um, and I, I really think like we do need with us, you know, countries this big and societies this big, we need some laws and rules to stop us from hurting each other and oppressing each other, you know, but beyond that, leave people alone. Like, you know, let them marry who they love, you know, let us live how we want to live. If it's not causing harm to someone else you know the oppressions um you know and yeah mistreatment of people in the or, 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 really or, or, really. or you know as i say like i i often say like you don't have to get transgenderism you don't have to get non-binaryism just don't be an a-hole basically and uh if only it were that simple but yes i agree yeah <laughs> now um uh, my second to last question I wanted to ask you is, uh, is how how big is the anti-war, anti-imperialist movement in the indigenous uh, community? Because I would imagine, given uh, the U.S. is still a settler colonial uh, society in which indigenous people uh, are brutally subjugated, uh, to I would imagine that the that that, that indigenous people tend to be quite anti-war and very anti-imperialist when it comes to uh america's foreign policy whether it's meddling in peru peruvian affairs bolivian affairs supporting right-wing uh, death squads in latin america and we were talking off the air about palestine and it's been imp it's been amazing to see not just the global solidarity protests for the palestinians but that in australia in new zealand in canada and yours truly, the United States, a lot of indigenous people have been participating in the protests, even leading the protests and and, and, and be and, and invited to speak at the protests. So I'm curious your thoughts on the on the anti-war, anti-imperialist uh, attitudes and actions of, uh, you know, of, of Native Americans. Yes, I, I do think that you know, Native communities broadly have empathy with anyone who's being subjected to some sort of colonization um, and find affinity with those who are being subjected to it. Uh, it is also, like a lot of things, not quite so simple. Um, you know, yes, I, I would say there's a lot to say about what's going on in Gaza. I do think, you know, the initial terrorist act, you know, killing Israeli citizens and taking captives, you know, ushered in a huge response. 
I, you know, you can say Israel has a right to defend itself from terror, but they didn't approach it simply with an eye to self-defense. They approached that opportunistically to make life miserable for the Palestinian population to displace them from their homelands and with utter disregard for any sanctity of human life with well over at this point in time well over 40,000 Palestinians killed keeping Israeli citizens safe did not require that response and you know it is pretty clear that Israel is just displacing mopping up making it so miserable so they can just take over and colonize more of Gaza and the West Bank um, it's an opportunistic response and it's really atrocious so a lot of people in the native community empathize with the Palestinian population, both with enduring human rights abuses and also being subjected, not just now, but throughout for, for many decades to a colonial displacement from land and disregard for their livelihoods and rights. So yes, that motivates a lot of people. Um, and I think broadly, the native population tends to, you know, be opposed to policies like those. Um, but at the same time, you know, Native Americans have a high rate of participation in the United States military. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, first of all, uh, anyone who is economically disadvantaged, it's one of the places where you can actually find economic opportunity and a place to be respected exactly um, so, so that has tracked native people into the military for those reasons I, I think also when you look at within families those who have um you know been in uniform receive respected positions as kind of warriors within sacred ceremonies and societies and things like that and so it also you know garners a certain level of prestige and respect within your own community. Um, and one of my friends, who he was in the Navy in the first Gulf War, and he would get that question sometimes. And he said, look, this land is my country. If I have to, you know, if I have to protect white people in order to protect my people, I'm okay with that. You know, um, and that was, his, <laughs> that was his perspective, right? Yeah. So, so I guess the bottom line is that, you know, Native people, serve in the United States Armed Forces at a higher rate per capita than any other racial group in the country. And at the same time, as a general rule, the native population tends to be broadly opposed to colonization and things like that. So that's what I mean when I say it's complex. It's not one thing. If you could, you could focus on just rates of service in the military and be like, oh, they're a bunch of colonists, you know, pro-colonial stuff, what happened to them? You know, or you could look at the native protest community and be like, oh, well, they're opposed to every kind of thing. They're anti-military. Neither would be accurate. Fascinating. And uh, uh, this will be my last question, which is uh, and you which is uh, how do you think how do you think, given the indigenous uh, media, which you consume and, 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 and the communities you speak to, not just in Minnesota, but across the country. How do you think the indigenous vote's going to be uh, with this, uh, yeah, with this Kamala Harris versus uh, Donald Trump uh, race? I think the native population will vote overwhelmingly for, you know, Harris Waltz. Um, not even abstaining. So, so not even abstaining because they're tired of, broken promises some are tired oh of some well um you know i think like trump has been so abrasively racist like you know back in the previous elections like in the 2016 you know when elizabeth warren was a contender you know and he was calling her pocahontas and stuff like that and then his actions when he um assumed the presidency after that election um, green lighting pipelines and breaking up the protest at Standing Rock. Like those things are not forgotten. Um, and recent statements just, you know, I think that will mobilize some of the native vote. I think the only thing that deflates the native vote is that 
a lot of Native people have been really upset with the Biden administration over its, you know, carte blanche support of Israel and its oppression of the Palestinian people. And so, Interesting. you know, so that will deflate some of that support. And as a general rule, there's so many more Democrats than Republicans in America. When the Democratic base is energized, they win overwhelmingly with a mandate. And when the Democratic base is deflated, they, the Republicans can contend. So like, I think someone like Obama, when he was running, energized a lot of the Democratic base with the idea of hope, of change in America, things like that, and the Democrats cleaned house. And I think, um, you know, I don't have a perfect crystal ball with what's going to happen in this election. It'll be a very close election and it will come down to a few key swing states. I do think that, you know, Harris is slightly more likely to win um, in some of those swing states, but that is, I am not resting on any laurels with that or breathing any size of relief. I think, um, I think it's going to be very, very close and we need all the votes we can get. And, you know, the Biden administration's treatment of Israel has damaged um, the excitement of the base for the Democratic Party. And that will hurt more than any positive mobilization on the Republican side for, you know, for, you know, affecting that election. And frankly, I mean, objectively, those who are disgusted with you know, the, the carte blanche support for Israel may know objectively that the Republican support will be even more steadfast, right? Oh, yeah. But it is still hard. Like, it leaves them feeling like, which one of these oppressions do I sign up for? As opposed to, I'm going to sign up for something progressive and liberating as opposed to oppressing. And so that 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 will hurt them. Um you know, but it's going to be close and, you know, I'm casting my vote. <laughs> are you, are you now, uh, are you going to vote now? No judgment, no judgment whatsoever, but are you going to be one of those, uh, I'm going to hold my nose and vote for uh, Kamala Harris because, <laughs> because of the ghastly neo-Confederate <laughs> fascistic Republicans or I'm curious. No, I actually, I do intend to vote Democrat, and I don't feel like I'm just holding my nose. Okay. It's just the lesser of evils. I, uh, you know, I've been following Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan in Minnesota very closely. I believe in them. Um, Kamala Harris is outlining positions, some of which are different, you know, than what we saw during the Biden administration. Um it is politically tough for her to be tough on Israel right now, and that's disappointing. But I think her social agenda will mark a departure from the Biden administration in a positive way. And I, um, I'm um, i going to feel good about voting for them. All righty. Uh, I'll respectfully agree to disagree with that. But like I said, no judgments. <laughs> No judgment at all, and and uh, in fact, I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping to do a debate uh, uh where where where, it's, where where I push back against the whole don't vote for uh, the Democrats uh, because of yada yada yada, and I'm hoping to actually like participate in a debate like that because I do understand why some people feel the need to vote. A Democrat as a way to block uh, the even worse, uh, you, you know, Republicans, and so, yeah, no problem. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that I don't find a lot of affinity with Cornell West or something like that, too. Dr. Jill Stein, Claudia De La Cruz, and sure, yep. And I do think we need rank choice voting where people don't have to feel like I'm throwing away my vote or it's a protest vote to vote for who they really want. Um, and they may get their second choice candidates on some of these elections, but it may actually get a more diverse representation within our political system. And I do think we need to move in that direction. And uh, bonus question, and then I'm going to let you go. <laughs> if you could replace Mount Rushmore uh, with uh, indigenous historical uh, figures, uh, 
uh, past or present, living or dead, who would you like to see replace Washington, Jefferson, Abe Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt? All of whom <laughs> have also done unspeakable, uh, unspeakable. I'd blast them all off of there and let Mother Nature speak for herself. Huh? I said I would blast all their faces off of there and let Mother Nature speak for herself. <laughs> no, and not replaced with any indigenous historical figures or no? Nah. No. Nah, let... Mother Nature is a far better artist. That doesn't mean I don't have people I think are awesome. You know, it's just the custom of chiseling faces into stone to maintain them in perpetuity. Like, I don't That's know. Not your thing. It's, it's silly. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, on that note, we were joined on this edition of One Plus One, our Native Lives Matter edition covering the plight of indigenous people across Turtle Island, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. Uh, folks, uh, please check out Professor Anton Schroyer. Follow him on all, on all the social medias. He's on uh, he's he's on Instagram. He's on Twitter and so forth. Get his books, especially his new first time novel. There it is, where wolves don't die. Professor, thank you so much for coming back on. All my best to you and all uh, all my best to you and your community and all Indigenous people. And looking forward to having you uh, back on. I hope very much in the near future. But until then, uh, please uh, you know keep up keep up the great work you do. All right. Thank you.